Good morning. And how do y'all on this Palm Sunday? Isn't it? Let's hope we see the same thing next Sunday. Yeah, and it is. It is Palm Sunday. Uh, this Wednesday, we will be finishing the book of Zechariah, the last couple of chapters. And Thursday uh, is going to be a Monday Thursday service. We will have that at 6 p.m. And that will be, and we'll do it in Fellowship Hall. And on Good Friday service, we'll also be at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. And Sunday, everything on as usual. Looking forward to that. Uh, Tuesday, April 6th at 10 a.m. is a scheduled meeting of the UMW. Then Sunday, April 11th, a governing board meeting. And April 18th is going to be Native American Ministry Sunday, and there'll be a special offering. Reminder that we continue to receive or accept donations for Operation Christmas Child. And we've got another three, four days for crafts. Do you remember what's coming next? No. Okay. Well, uh, something to look forward to learning next week. Uh huh. Okay. Well, here we are. Uh, I welcome you all to worship this Palm Sunday, uh, and I encourage you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship as we hear the prelude together. Good morning. Our opening hymn this morning is Open Our Eyes. It's on page 2086 of your black hymnal. We'll sing through it two times.
I invite you to join me for our opening prayer. Almighty God, on this day, your Son, Jesus Christ, entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed King by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let those branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen. this day for the opportunity to remember and celebrate the day, the day Jesus presented himself to be our king. And we ask that you might grant us by your spirit the wisdom to truly 
and fully receive him however he would come. We thank you uh, today for your providence in our lives and for the plans that you have for your people for the future. We ask that you would be with those who are recovering from the damage of the tornadoes and who have suffered loss in Alabama and in Georgia. Help David and Tilly and all the others to get back on their feet, to rebuild whatever has been broken, and to, to come to a place of restoration. We're thankful for all the people that we have with us here today to worship in your presence, to welcome you again as our Lord, as the Prince of Peace. For that day you entered Jerusalem, the earthly city of God. You came humbly on a donkey. And there you revealed your everlasting kingdom through the blood of your cross, which also established it. May that kingdom rule in our hearts and be lifted up in our praises and the voice of jubilation go out to the ends of the earth until that day when all your people are united in that great heavenly Jerusalem. Today, you ride up to the gates of our hearts, seeking to enter our lives that you might have your home in our midst. Help us receive you with thanksgiving and joy, laying before you all our trophies and treasures, our hopes, and all our dreams. Here is a mystery, fearsome and wonderful, that the road to your great and glorious kingdom leads to and through your cross. In your great faithfulness and love, help us find strength and courage to keep the faith and stay the course. We commend our lives into your hands in anticipation of that day when you welcome us all into your heavenly Jerusalem. Now we pray together as our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is To God Be the Glory. It's on page 98 in your red hymnal. We'll sing all three verses. <laughs>
may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading is Isaiah 50, 4 through 11. The Sovereign Lord has given me the capacity to be his spokesman so that I know how to help the weary. He wakes me up every morning. He makes me alert so I can listen attentively as disciples do. The Sovereign Lord has spoken to me clearly. I have not rebelled. I have not turned back. I offered my back to those who attacked, my jaw to those who tore out my beard. I did not hide my face from insults and spitting. But the Sovereign Lord helps me so I am not humiliated. For that reason, I am steadfastly resolved. I know I will not be put to shame. The one who vindicates is close by. Who dares argue with me? Let us confront each other. Who is my accuser? Let him challenge me. Look, the sovereign Lord helps me. Who dares condemn me? Look, all of them will wear out like clothes. A moth will eat away at them. Who among you fears the Lord? Who listens to the voice of his servant? Whoever walks in deep darkness without light should trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Look, all of you who start a fire and equip yourself with flaming arrows, walk in the light of fire you started and among the flaming arrows you ignited. That This is what you will receive from me. You will lie down in a place of pain. Our scripture reading is John 12, 12 through 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done by him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they had heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. John's gospel is a little different from the others in that he identifies a, a slightly different reason why the authorities particularly wanted to kill Jesus. I'm sure the cleansing of the temple wasn't a very good mark either, but they had already decided to kill him because of Lazarus. And we read that the people are coming to see Lazarus as well, this mighty sign. I remember when we were covering the Gospel of John some years ago in a Sunday school class while I was still at seminary. Somebody was, made a question or a comment, and I said, well, you know, why did Jesus wait so long to resurrect Lazarus? And the teacher almost cut him off saying, no, Jesus did not resurrect Lazarus. He resuscitated Lazarus. That's not a resurrection. It's a resuscitation. And that kind of stuck in my mind because was that part of the problem with why the crowd could just suddenly turn on Jesus? He shows up on a donkey and they don't quite get it, but they hail him as the king. What are they looking for? They're not looking for a cross and a resurrection. They're looking for a resuscitation. They want Israel to be resuscitated, the glory days of David and Solomon to be restored. They want Israel to be independent again, to have an army. Yes, they want justice and they want all these things, but the crowd could turn on him so fast because they wanted a lion and they were getting a lamb. That's one of the most wonderful images in the book of Revelation, and it's one that hardly needs any explanation, when all of heaven is mourning and John is weeping because no one is found worthy to open this scroll. He hears a voice cry out, the Lion of Judah is worthy. So he turns, and does he see a lion? No, he says, look, I saw standing 
In the midst of the throne and the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slaughtered. The lion came as a lamb. They wanted a fierce king. That's our perfect model for a king, one who's absolutely fierce against his enemies, tender-hearted to his own people. But as Jesus is about to point out, as everyone is expecting a great victory, it's not Lazarus that he's going to use to draw all people to himself, but his cross. We took the passages out of order, but that's coming up next. When I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And I imagine the people of Jerusalem, that's what they were doing. They wanted to be lions in one form or another. And is it any surprise that when push came to shove, after Jesus gave himself, allowed himself to be beaten, to be whipped, and Pilate took him out and said, who do you want me to release to you? They saw this poor beaten figure that just sat there and took it, and this other Barabbas, who at least had the courage to fight for them. And they said, give us Barabbas. They lit those fires, those flaming arrows, And one day the whole city of Jerusalem would come down in torment because they did not receive him as he came. In a way, I feel feel sorry for, for Lazarus. I mean, if Jesus had shown up a little earlier, not only would he not have had to go through the the pain of dying and then the confusion of waking up in a tomb tied up in, in cloth, but they wouldn't be trying to kill him too. It's not just Jesus that they're trying to kill anymore. Now it's Lazarus. He's a walking testimony. And he could have said to Jesus, hey, you know, if you just healed me, I, you know, you've done that all over. They wouldn't be upset with me. But you waited, and now they want to kill me too. Is this what I get for being your friend? You have to show up in a way that's going to have the whole world come after me? The irony, of course, is is that in many ways, there are people out there that are still trying to kill Jesus. As an example, I think back to the 90s. I was still in college, and people were were talking about uh, the Jesus Seminar. It was a group of scholars that pretended that they were representative, and they they weren't. They were very, um, they were a subset of scholars. And they wanted to go through the Bible and basically vote on the words that in the old King James editions would have been printed in red letters. The words supposedly said by Jesus. And they had a a set of votes where everybody would be given marbles of different colors. A red marble felt, meant that they felt that Jesus had, yeah, probably said it. A pink marble said, well, it sounds like something he might have said, but maybe it's been reworded. A gray marble meant, you know, he probably didn't say it. And a black marble meant he certainly didn't say it. Their criterion was odd. Is anything that Jesus said that sounded Christian had to be gotten rid of? In all of this preaching about the kingdom of God and the eschatology and him expecting God to show up, it's strange as though they expected Jesus to be unfamiliar with Isaiah or all the visions of the prophets. But that was one criterion. So if it sounded too Christian, then he couldn't have said it. And if it sounded too Jewish, if it sounded familiar, then he didn't say it. The end result was they came up with 82% of the sayings were gray or black. And the red ones, the ones that they were willing to concede, much less than all the others put together. So you see, suddenly Jesus disappears. And it was an effort to have people, and I don't think they believe this, so don't hear this as an accusation against them. I'm sure their motives were, to their own minds, quite pure. But what they wanted to do was get rid of what they called the Jesus of faith, to recover the Jesus of history. And I remember saying somewhat snidely at the time, I'm just not interested in the historical Jesus because he's dead. That's what you believe about him. You want to put him back in the tomb. I'm not interested in that Jesus. That Jesus has no power. They're still, in some ways, trying to kill Jesus. The irony is, is what I didn't know at the time, right there, 92, 93, 94, 
Those same years, the Jesus that supposedly never came out of the tomb was showing up just a few miles to the west, not far from Sacramento, in Folsom Prison. A book came out uh, either last year or the year before called The Shot Caller, written by Casey Diaz. As a young man, his mother and father had moved from El Salvador to escape the violence there at the time. His father was an extraordinarily abusive and violent man, in fact, so much that the earliest incident that Casey Diaz recounts in his book is one day when his dad was unconscious on the floor, he moved his head closer to a gas heater and opened the valve hoping the gas would take care of him. His mother discovered it, pulled him away and closed the gas, but his life didn't get any better from then. At the age of 11, he was inducted into one of the gangs in Los Angeles. And from there, it just sort of went downhill, not just for him, but for anyone who knew him. Many incidences of violence. He was particularly fond of screwdrivers a lot of carjackings, home invasions, and finally, one charge he couldn't escape, second degree murder, for which he was tried as an adult. It was something new in California at the time. But they couldn't just put him in the juvenile detention center, he was too bad, they sent him to a, a special place to serve out his sentence of 12 and a half years, and while there, he continued to practice his extreme violence I suppose he wanted to be a lamb or lion instead of a lamb. That's how it all started. He wanted to protect his mother. But the savagery just increased. He became more and more of a wolf so that while he was there in that detention facility, he became a shot caller, which was essentially somebody who never got their hands dirty but could give any instruction to have anything done, anything moved, all the way up to and including having somebody killed. After he turned 18, they should, in California, keep somebody who's a juvenile offender until they're 25, not him. But when he turned 18, he underwent an evaluation where they would determine the amount of security that would be appropriate to him based on gang contacts, past violence, offense. And it was a rolling scale that went from one to 100, and he scored a 97. So he was moved to Folsom Prison, the new Folsom Prison, and he went straight into what he called the shoe, solitary confinement. Nothing but four walls, a concrete bed with a two-inch mattress on it, no human contact, only an hour outside each day where he was chained to a wall. It was incredibly lonely, and people in that circumstance would occasionally lose their minds. He could still recall years later the horrible sound of people who, not having any tools to hang themselves, would try to charge against the metal door in order to end the agony of their solitude. One of the fellow prisoners actually thought his cell was full of ducks. And at one point, one day as he was lying on his bunk, perhaps counting the holes in the ceiling again, it was some 3,280 of them. He looked to the side at the wall and he suddenly saw as if a movie were being projected there, clear as crystal, the events of his life playing forward from his childhood, all the violent things he had done, all the bad stuff, and interspersed in it, even though he was not a churchgoer, nominally Catholic, never really been to church, Interspersed in the midst of those scenes of what he had done was the image of a man carrying a cross. And it would flip back and forth as his life would play forward until finally he saw that man nailed to a cross and lifted up. And at the end of that movie, the man on the cross looked at him and said, Darwin, which is his birth name. Casey is a nickname. Darwin, he said, I did this for you. He remembers falling and crying in his cell and realizing and he needed God to forgive him. And then he remembers God telling him, you need to call for a chaplain. He didn't even know what a chaplain was. Wasn't sure. The guards thought he was crazy. He said, could you, I, need, I don't know. I don't know what a chaplain is or why. I was just told I need to get a chaplain. The chaplain came and when he heard what he had seen, he walked him through 
the passion of Jesus, which is what we remember this week. And you can see here we are in the 12th chapter of John that's 21 chapters long. And we're already in Jerusalem looking at that week. That's how important it is. The chaplain left him with a Bible. And he remembers how in the days followed that he just read it all the time. The Bible came to life to him because Jesus was real to him. He didn't even hardly understand it. He had the one with the these and the thous, the King James English. And for somebody who never paid attention to school, I imagine it was hard to understand. But he would fall asleep reading it, wake up with it under him and start reading it again. The second thing he heard God say to him, he said, when you get out of here, you need to call your homies together and tell them that you're through with the gang life because you're a Christian now. And he thought, okay. He imagined with so many years left in his sentence that one day perhaps he would get out and he would go back to his old neighborhood and, and get the people together and let them know that he was done with it. But it wasn't a matter of years and a matter of days. The warden came down with the corrections officer and opened his cell in the middle of the day. I mean, this isn't done. Prison happens on a schedule. And he remembers the warden saying, you know, I don't know why we're doing this, but we're moving you to mainline. That meant that they were moving him to the more dormitory style of detention. So he would no longer be in solitary. That day came much more quickly than he imagined. But true to what God told him, he walked out into the yard up to a group of people, he got them together around a table and said, I'm done with the gang life. I'm a Christian now. And he knew what that meant. He knew that they would give, somebody would call the shot and say that he needed to be taken out. You just don't turn your back on a gang. You don't desert from them. But he did it anyway and sure enough, sooner rather than later, a member of his gang from Los Angeles showed up. He guessed that it was because they figured he was the defector, his gang needed to take care and clean up their own mess. It was a guy named Mosca. And he showed up and he said to him, you need to change your story because they're asking me to take you out. He said, look, I understand the politics in here and you've got to do what you've got to do, but..." I can't change my story. You don't get it, he said. They're going to, they told me to take you out. No, I'm sorry, he said, you don't understand. I cannot change my story. I know what I saw and I know who I am now. But, he added, I just want you to know that I forgive you for what you're going to do. It's all good, brother. I forgive you, you need to know that. What did Mosca do? actually kind of lost his temper. He just fumed and stormed out of the cell. Well, he knew that somebody would be coming the following day. They'd just send somebody else. So he spent that night reading the scriptures, praying, unafraid, but waiting. He had resigned himself to whatever would happen, and he fully expected that they would take him out. The next day, Moscow returned seconds after the doors swung open in the morning, as they automatically did. And he looked at him and said something curious. He said, look, you better be right because I can't do this to you. I can't do this. I just can't. Well, he kind of spoke to him. He was just basically resigned to doing nothing and letting it happen. He said, hey, look, if you don't do this, they're going to put a call out on you. He recognized that. He said, I can't go through with it. You're different I can tell. Why are you different? He gave him a thumbnail version of the gospel. And then before he left, he said, I'm down with you. In other words, he had chosen Christ over his life. That was what that meant. And now they were both waiting for what would happen. As it turned out, through the providence of God, they decided not to get rid of them, to kill them. They decided instead to give them hard candy, is what they called it in the prisons. It means a very severe beating. And this continued on an almost weekly basis, month after month after month, sending them to the infirmary again and again. I offered my back to those who attacked, my jaws to those who tore out my beard. 
I did not hide my face from insults and spitting, but the sovereign Lord helps me so I am not humiliated. For that reason I am steadfastly resolved, I know I will not be put to shame. The one who vindicates me is close by. That was the attitude Jesus came with to Jerusalem and it's really the one he struggled to maintain, but it was difficult. That was a very painful and humiliating experience. And he found himself growing angry with God. So to saying, why, if, why did you get involved with me if it was gonna be like this? Look at what I gave up for you. He wrote, well, he kind of felt the Lord coming back at him saying, you gave up nothing for me. I'm the one who gave up everything for you. It was a kind of a, a close struggle. And the days went on. And eventually he came up for his first parole. He had no expectation of being released, especially when he heard that one of the people on the parole board was well known to everybody, he was called Maximum John, an older guy with a, a white beard who was just missing a red cap to look like Santa Claus, except he wasn't Santa Claus. He came to give everybody a lump of coal. It was his habit to make sure that every person in prison served every day they possibly could. And when he got in there, he said, you know, after they asked him, why should you be released? He said, you know, I shouldn't. I deserve every single day and everything that I get when I'm in here because of what I did. And not just for the things I did, I got caught for, but for the other things. And then he was asked back in to the parole board. And they asked a pastor who had come to sit and pray with him before the meeting. They said, are there any good restaurants where you live? Which made no sense. And then they asked him, what are you going to have for lunch today? And he still didn't get it. And they told him, well, we're going to release you. It made no sense. And it was actually Maximum John himself who explained why. He said, we've seen lots of jailhouse religion. People come in here with their Bibles, and then the second they get out, they're no different than they were before. But we know you're different. We see the documentation of the beatings. They meant it for evil, God meant it for good. It reminds me, this idea of really looking for resurrection, of knowing that we have to, to lay down our life in order to receive it back again, of something we covered this week. It just happened by coincidence. I didn't even uh, select the book of Zechariah, that was done by vote. But this last week, the passage we looked at had precisely this prophecy where it says that your king will come to you or is coming to you humble and riding on a donkey, not on a war horse, not as the lion you were hoping for, but he'll come humble and riding on a donkey. And that prophecy goes on to say he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the war horse from Jerusalem. It doesn't mean he's gonna stop them from coming in. It means he's going to take them away. He's going to strip Israel of its arms. It's gonna disarm them. And that's indeed sort of what he did. He says, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit or from solitary confinement. The blood of the covenant. It's an interesting expression. It occurs there in Zechariah. It occurs in Exodus 24, where Moses takes half the blood and throws it on the altar, and the other half, he throws it on the people and says, this is the blood of the covenant. And immediately after that, Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 elders go up to the mountain of God and in God's presence have a covenant meal. How much does that sound like the Last Supper and the price Jesus paid to make that fellowship with God possible again? He said something interesting too, the prophet in that passage. Yes, he would strip the, the war horse from Jer uh, Jerusalem and the chariot, but he also, he also says this, I have bent Judah as my bow, Ephraim its arrow. He's now going to send his people out with his word, with the good news, with the proclamation of the gospel, to 
to let people know that Jesus is still alive. He's still available despite what the Jesus seminar might have said. But the reason that spoke to me, that idea of the bow and the arrow, of turning people into the analogy of, of weapons, is because I didn't really give any account for why somebody so wrapped in violence, so much seeking to be a lion and simply becoming a ravenous wolf, why the Lord would appear to him in his cell. There's really only one thing that he could point to, and it was a, a seemingly small bow in Compton or near Compton in Southern California in Los Angeles. It was an African-American Baptist church, and the arrow that God sent to Folsom was a woman named Frances Proctor. She and others from that small church would travel eight hours to Folsom Prison, all the way down from Los Angeles to up near Sacramento, once a month, to go in and to offer Christ to the prisoners. And somehow, Frances Proctor, this diminutive older lady, had managed to talk someone into letting her into the most secure part of the prison, the solitary confinement unit. And she would come in and announce Protestant service, Protestant service, as anyone interested. And she noticed that around the corner, almost behind the door, there was room for another cell. And she asked the guard, is there somebody in there? Is there a cell there? Yes, the guard said, but you don't want to know him. That's Diaz. No, she said, Jesus came for everyone. And she kept pressing until she actually got permission to go up and talk to him. And all there is is a little metal grate, I think about halfway down the door, so all he could see was uh, what he described as her bony legs. But the upshot of it was she said, you know, um, I'm going to pray for you, even though he brushed her off and he thought she was crazy. She said, I'm going to pray for you, and God is going to use you. And she did for 18 months. And so eventually he could write her after she wrote him a letter and let, him, let her know that she'd come to know the Lord. Eventually after he got out, he even surprised her at her church where he was a welcome back to them. But that's all it was, which was a lot more than anything that the world could throw at him or do for him, was the prayers of a saint in a church who noticed him and knew that Jesus was there for him and prayed and prayed and prayed. That was the thing that opened up the doors. And Jesus came to him. The interesting part of the story, too, was that, you know, a sort of resuscitation did happen. He got his first job, minimum wage, working for an uncle, a small check, but he said it was the happiest day of his life because he'd never earned an honest dollar before. He bounced around a little bit, and he took up an interest in uh, art, and eventually he opened his own business, which was funny to me because it's actually a sign business. That's his business. He makes signs for people. Samaya Signs, I think it is. And I thought, how wonderful. All that time with the Jesus Seminar was sitting there, once again trying to kill the life of Jesus, to reduce him to what the little tidbits left over that scholars could offer, another sign was being painted on the walls of a, a prison cell by the spirit of the living God. As John writes at the end of chapter 20, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. There are more signs in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in the world's philosophy. And they're still happening and they're still coming. And they're written with the spirit of the living God and with the prayers of the saints on the hearts of women and men any, everywhere. This is what we must never lose sight of. Jesus has been, is, and always will be the one who saves. And the actual answers to the problems that face the world. It is that simple. And this is the thing that we have to offer through our prayers and through our witness and through our service and through our faithfulness. If we remember that we need to receive what Jesus has to offer us. I think too, in closing here, that it can be more difficult 
for those who perhaps aren't as bad as Casey was. Because we're tempted to think that we do need resuscitation, right? Just a little caulk in the cracks. But that's not the message Jesus had. No, all have fallen short of the glory of God. We're all in that same boat. We all need him just as much as Casey did. And perhaps it's in occasionally stumbling and forgetting it that we can slip back into the crowds and we can begin to think that we need a lion and we unintentionally appoint wolves over ourselves because we forget that the king is a lamb and that he told us to go and preach the gospel not with sword and not with spear, but simply to preach it and to offer him with love. It isn't easy. It really isn't. And simply because our degree of difficulty doesn't resemble his, the world does beat us up in one way or another. And we've had a, a mighty year to beat us up, black and blue. And many of you have had things happen this year that are very, very difficult. We must always receive this, however, as the hand of the Lord, and to know that he is faithful to deliver, and that he will give us that resurrection life, and that we still do have power, because he hears our prayers, and there's no place they cannot reach, and no heart that they cannot turn. Once we bring them the good news of Jesus Christ, the lion who is the lamb. Amen. At this uh, time, I remind you that the offering plates are at the rear of the sanctuary on either side of the central aisle near the exit. And I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Most merciful and gracious God, you have poured out your precious and costly love upon us through your son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you would accept our gifts as our free and grateful response to Christ pouring out his life for us, that we might become truly free, free from fear of sin, of punishment, of suffering, of death, of life. For you alone are God who lives and rules forever without end. Hosanna in the highest. Amen.
May God grant you grace to follow in faith where Christ has led, that you may live each day with courage and perseverance. Take up your cross and follow him, laying down the life of selfishness and with it the life of fear in the sure and certain knowledge that God will raise you up in his likeness. Amen. Oh,